<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Vermont Community Leadership Network workshop. We're going to give a couple minutes for folks to trickle in um, and then get started. Look at all these superstars from our meeting the other night. <laughs> Good to see Hi, you Tom. guys. How are you? Good. Welcome, everybody. There's still people streaming in the waiting room here, Alyssa, so we should give it a couple minutes before we get launched. Alyssa and Jenna, while we're waiting, can I ask you a quick question? We might maybe wait until at, at the end. So I think we're going to get going pretty quickly. Okay, and we've got sure. about 60 other people on the call who okay. may not want to hear the answers. No worries. But I think I, I'm hopping off after, but maybe Alyssa can hang out. Um, it's just minutes. an email I got from USDA Rural Development. I just want to make sure it's real. So I'll just forward it to you. You can look <laughs> at it and delete it. Yeah, so. we can help verify if you want to forward you. it along. That'd be great. Thanks, Tom. Well, Alyssa, you want me to dive in with just a, a hello and intro, and then I'll turn it over to you to sound great. the workshop. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Happy Friday morning. It's Friday, right? <laughs> Friday morning. <laughs> We're here. We've arrived. Um, thanks so much for joining. Um, a couple of quick things just as an introduction, and then I'm really going to I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Alyssa Johnson, to run the show here and our wonderful panelists have joined us. But um, this is one of our Vermont Community Leadership Network workshops. I'm Jenna Koloski, I'm the Community Engagement and Policy Director with the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Um, the Council on Rural Development, or VCRD, is uh, essentially we are a neutral facilitator of community process. We facilitate community conversations, we facilitate statewide conversations, but we also offer technical assistance, coaching, support, um, and just doing everything we can to be useful to communities as they look to the future and identify things that are important to them and then get really important work done all around the state. So one way that we do that is through this Vermont Community Leadership Network. Um, this is a network of, I think, nearly three or 4,000 Vermonters um, like yourselves that are just out there in communities getting things done, whether it's an informal, uh, roles in their community, formal, formal leadership roles, nonprofit leaders, business leaders. It's a broad mix of people from around the state that come together um, to learn together, to share resources, to connect with each other, and sometimes to hear from experts um, that could support their work. And that's really what we're here to do today. So the focus of this workshop, you know, at VCRD, we're working with communities right now that are coming to us saying, there's resources coming our way. There's unprecedented funding coming our way. What do we do to get it? How do we um, access it? And most importantly, who are the people that can help us? Um, we know that capacity is limited in your communities. We know that a lot of this is volunteer run or run by one maybe part-time staffer in your community. Um, the good news is there are resources at the local, regional, and state level that can help um, if you're looking to some significant uh, funding resources that you're hoping to access in your community. So that's the goal of this workshop is to hear from some of these folks that are there to help and can share the resources that are available to you. Um, so I'm going to turn it over. Speaking of people who can help, uh, my colleague Alyssa Johnson, um, we have now built in full time staff on BCRD that can be supportive to communities, provide technical assistance. Um, as they get work done. And Alyssa is that person. So she's the person on our team who has been a point person helping communities access some of this um, funding that's available to them. So she'll be running the show and I'll turn it over to you, Alyssa, to introduce our panelists as well. Thanks everyone. Nice to see you. Thanks so much, Jenna. And thank you everyone for being here. I think Jenna teetered up really well, um, just on a personal 
note, you know, in addition to working for VCRD, I also serve as a member of my local select board. So really appreciating that big picture challenge of knowing that this funding is here and also feeling like in some cases there is a lot of support. And in some cases, you know, there's support out there, but what's really that idea of who you can connect with and who might be able to be that helping hand. So really excited, as Jenna said, to have a diversity of panelists from a variety of different organizations. Um, so want to just really thank them for our time. Our structure for this morning is that our first hour, so from now till about 11 o'clock, is going to be really going through each of our four different panelists who I'll introduce in a moment and letting them share some background about the type of services their organization offers, how you as a community member or leader might be able to engage with them, um, and kind of how to do that most effectively, both for um, you as a community and so that they can help you the best that they can. Um, we are then going to stay on um, from 11 until 11.30 and have open time for question and answers. So know that if questions come up, um, because there is just so much info to get through, we're going to try and um, hold questions until 11. Um, I did see a question in the chat and just want to acknowledge that this is being recorded. Um, if you registered to get into this Zoom meeting today, um, we will share this link back out with you and it will be available on our VCRD website. Um, we also will put together any links or things like that that show up in the chat. So if you are worried about frantically copying things down, um, we are happy to provide all that information on the back end. So don't feel like you are stressed and needing to do that. Um, I am going to run through our panelists super quickly, but then actually just turn it right over to them to do more extended introductions and also share a little bit about um, their context and the services they offer. So I will just read quickly our four panelists and I'm gonna try pinning them. If we hate the video format, we can get rid of it, but in the always experimenting, we're gonna do, okay, so ready? So first I'm gonna pin, we have Ms. Katie Buckley, who maybe doesn't need an introduction, um, but is the director of the Federal Funding Assistance Program at the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Oh, now see it's changed my whole screen. So now I gotta find Ms. Mariah. Um, so next up we have Ms. Mariah Knopf, who is the program manager for the Rural Economic Development Initiative. All right, I gotta unpin you, Katie, because I can't see, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you everyone for the Zoom, Zoom patience. Um, let's see if I can find Mariah. I see you laughing, Mariah, as you're being introduced. Okay, so now we're gonna pin Mariah. Oh, here we go. All right, let's see if I can get them all pinned just to start so that I can, oh yeah, here we go. Pin, add, pin. All right, now I'm gonna find Katie again. Thank you, everyone. All right, that was the necessary pre-work. So here is your panel. Here is all four of the folks. So I was just saying, Ryan Knopf, um, who is the uh, Rural Economic Development Manager at the HCB. We have Meg Slop, the Southern Vermont Economy Manager at Brattleboro Development Credit Corp. And I will just say offhand, Brattleboro Development Credit Corp, or BDCC, is a uh, regional Development Corporation, or RDC, we're all going to try really hard to explain and say out any acronyms we use, maybe except for ARPA, um, but also just acknowledging that BDCC is one of those regional development corporations, but there is one that corresponds to your region, and so we can talk through that as well. Um, similarly, we have Kevin Geiger, who is the Director of Planning at Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission. That is a regional planning commission or RPC. And again, um, Two Rivers Ottaquichi may be yours or depending on what region of the state, there may be another one. Um, so with that, I think let's just dive right in. I'm seeing some questions in the chat. Again, we'll try and respond to those, but um, we'll have Katie kick it off with talking about um, more details about her and her position and also the types of services VLCT and her program um, may be able to offer. Great. Thanks, Alyssa. And thanks, Jenna, for that great tee up. Um, I'm Kay Buckley. I'm the director of the Federal Funding Assistance Program. I have slides, so I'm going to attempt to share my screen here, if that's okay. So I can get started. Are you able to see that? All right, let's see if I can move my zoom over there. Great. Excellent. Um, so again, I'm Katie Buckley, Director of the Federal Funding Assistance Program for the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Um, VLCT is a nonprofit, nonpartisan member organization made up of Vermont's 247 towns and cities across the state, as well as other entities. Uh, we were founded in 1967, alive and well for 56 years with the mission of serving and strengthening Vermont local government. Um, I'm excited to be here and share a little bit more about what VLCT is doing to support local officials as they navigate this 
broad universe of federal funding that currently exists. Um, as we know, we are in a unique moment. There are more federal dollars available for communities than any of us have ever experienced before. There are quite literally billions of dollars flowing through, uh, through and to Vermont um, for new and existing programs. Some of this money will go to the state of Vermont. Some of it will be passed through the state made available to municipalities through grants and incentives. And some of it would be funding opportunities offered um, directly from federal agencies that municipalities can access. Um, for all of it, the biggest issue that we're facing is limited capacity. Um, we're, we're all talking about it really daily um, and in our local governments and in our communities and it's, it's limited capacity to access these funds. Um, towns either lack the bodies, the skills or both to tee up competitive projects, identify appropriate grant opportunities um, to fund them and then apply for these funds. So VLCT created the Federal Funding Assistance Program to respond to this need. Um, it's, it was formally launched last December. We're only three months old. We're new and growing um, in terms of our resources and tools that we're building and providing. Um, the Federal Funding Assistance Program now wraps ARPA um, American Rescue Plan Act funding, every town, city, and village in the state of Vermont, um, with the exception of one, actually accepted their ARPA funding. Um, so we still offer all the same support around ARPA. We're just rolling it up into the federal funding assistance program since it too is a piece of federal funding. So why not put it right under there? Um, our team is small. It is me and Bonnie Wanninger, who is in the audience today. I saw her there. Hello, Bonnie. Um, they're just two of us, uh, but that's okay. We're small but mighty. We work with all towns, no matter how big or how small. Um, like we did with ARPA, we hope to become Vermont's high level experts on federal funding opportunities currently available. So we can be a resource to others, both municipalities and our partners throughout the state um, so that Vermont can make the most of this rare moment. Uh, what does the federal funding assistance program at VLCT offer? Well, many of our members don't know where to start. It's like winning the lottery, right? You get a lot of money. Do you spend it all on toys or do you take some time um, and be strategic and make smart investments? And towns across the state are doing just that. We think the latter and our members need help setting priorities, figuring out how to advance them. And typically all this involves money. And we started with that, the money. So VLCT called uh, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, between them, there's about 500 grant programs that are out there, funding opportunities, incentives. Um, and it's uh, mind numbing, to be honest. And so uh, we went through, mainly Bonnie, thank you, and called all the programs that are both, uh, Vermont municipalities are eligible applicants and they are applicable to the type of work that we uh, do here in Vermont. It is a living document that will be updated as we learn more information. Um, and it's also a beast of a document. So we actually use it as a resource ourselves and are distilling the information further and then presenting it in a way that's easier for everybody to use. So you'll see on this slide and actually throughout my slide deck, any language that's bolded and underlined it, it's a link to another resource. I'll be sharing my slide deck with VCRD and they can share it back to anybody who wants it. But if you click on those, and the images as well, they'll usually take you to a document resource or a website. Whoops, sorry, I got a little happy with my hand there. Okay. Uh, so no need to reinvent the wheel. We created a ton of web content in addition to that um, to walk towns through um, the universe of funding opportunities, right? Bringing it right down to the local level. We have topic areas um, that are ones that you'll see for most municipal type projects and initiatives that would they would fall into. Um, again, our program is new and as these pages, as we go, these pages will be updated. We're also going through a web refresh. So a lot of this content's gonna change. So um, stay tuned, it might look differently, but it will all be uh, the same information on the website. It'll just look a little different. And that web refresh will take place March 30th. Uh, all the reading and research creates lots of questions and when you just love to phone a friend and ask them, well, we created consults on call to do that. It allows towns to meet with us one-on-one -on -one to pose a problem they would like our help in solving. Typically it's about a local project or a funding opportunity, but it can be about municipal operations too. So it's, it's a 
kind of a, a helpline is what it is. We ask a lot of questions when we meet with um, a town. We listen and then we ask more. Um, we draft a summary and then we return it back to the town and the summary includes suggested next action steps, resources or connections to people or resource, uh, other partners who can help um, the project and often potential funding sources to consider in advancing their plans. Um, it's intended to be a leg of the journey on a roadmap. It might not get you to your destination, uh, but instead it gets you to your next decision point. Um, and towns are welcome to return to consults and call as often as they need. And when we're doing our consults on call, usually the first question we ask is, did you contact your RPC? And we partner very, very often with the local RPC or hand off to the local RPC or figure out best solutions with them. So they're a great partner through this as is the Ready program. Um, so my colleague Bonnie and I, we've written and administered a lot of different kinds of grants, state, federal, foundation, you name it, we've probably written an application for it. Um, I've also been on the funder side, so I know what funders are looking for in their applications. And so to, together, Bonnie and I are surfacing some of the little tips and tricks that we've learned along the way that have helped us be successful as we chase funds. And as the number of tips grows, uh, we will learn, we'll turn them into a searchable document to make things easier for users. So we have them currently posted on our website. We release one each week, um, and we hope that they'll be helpful as uh, local officials and municipalities are uh, becoming grant writers, taking on a new skill. Um, as I mentioned, our program's new uh, and we're growing. So uh, our resources will also be growing to better serve our towns. And that's my contact information. And hopefully I, I didn't talk too long, but I am gonna stop screen sharing and hand back over to Alyssa. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Katie. I wrote down leg on the journey. I think I'm going to steal that. And as we move to our next leg on the journey, or perhaps one of those, um, turn it over to Mariah to talk about more about the Ready program and how that maybe fits in as a leg on the journey. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I really appreciate it. Hi, folks. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Mariah Noth, and I work with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board and specifically manage our READY program, um, which is Rural Economic Development Initiative. We love our acronyms in Vermont, as Alyssa was mentioning, so I'll try to keep it as clear as we can. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll just start off by sharing that Vermont Housing and Conservation Board might be an organization that many folks on the call are familiar with from different aspects. It has uh, several different programs that have different focus areas, and I'm more than happy to make connections with any of my colleagues in the other focus areas. Um, so there's affordable housing development, uh, land, natural area, and outdoor recreation conservation wing of BHCB. There's a farm and forest viability business coaching program. So if you have folks in your regions that are looking at that, I'm happy to make that connection as well. Um, AmeriCorps is also housed at BHCB. And then um, Ready, uh, lovingly called Ready for short, um, I think is a great kind of nexus of a lot of the work that BHCB does. And as you might hear many times on this call, uh, we definitely uh, feel like Ready is a small but mighty program. Um, you know, our our funding amounts aren't super large each year, but we feel like um, they do a lot of great work out in communities. So I'll dive right in. Um, so Ready, uh, what, what do we do? We provide grant writing and technical assistance to small rural communities and working lands businesses with a goal of advancing economic development in Vermont. Um, so the clients that are eligible for Ready funds are municipalities, nonprofits, community-based organizations, um, and then in terms of the private business wing, we do also work with uh, working lands businesses. So that's farm, food, and forest-based businesses in Vermont. Um, thank you so much. Um, and then uh, in terms of, you know, the small rural definition for us, so for eligible clients, that's um, all of those groups must be based in communities in Vermont of 5,000 people or less. Um, and there's some great resources that I can drop in the chat around that you know, census numbers and if your community fits into that. Um, and again, I'm always happy as anyone on this call is to, to chat with folks who may or may not be eligible for ready funding and help uh, brainstorm resources that might be available or see if there's a, a piece of your project that may be able to work uh, with our funding. So projects that are eligible for funding. Um, so they must fall into one of our three kind of core focus areas as the ready program is actually based in Vermont statute. Um, so those areas are community-based economic development, which is our broadest bucket area, 
And so, you know, it may sound kind of general, but some examples that would fall under that category would be, you know, a community center, um, developing a child care center in your municipality, um, water or wastewater infrastructure, um, you know, historic preservation of buildings and downtown revitalization. And there's a variety of other projects that can fit under that as well, but just to give you some examples. Um, the other two focused areas are um, outdoor recreation uh, in your community and working land sector development. So again, that farm, food, forest, uh, land-based uh, business development. Um, I also wanna share that we completely recognize, especially at BHCB, that housing is absolutely an economic development strategy. Uh, Ready, however, has not kind of focused in that lane at this time, uh, given the resources that, that move toward housing through other areas at BHCB. Um, also wanted to share that our, our program, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit more later on in, in our panel, but um, is really, uh, our resources are quite targeted to a particular point in time when projects are really ready to seek significant sources of funding. So again, as we'll talk about legs on this journey, and I think uh, Vermont, we're so lucky to have this amazing kind of ecosystem of resource and support organizations here. And so often we'll, we'll work with an organization or with a client to figure out, okay, if you're more at an earlier stage, um, who's the best fit for you? And then when is it right for the ready leg of your journey? Um, so I'll just dive in quickly to some of the specific services that Ready provides, because I've spoken a little bit more generally about, you know, grant writing and technical assistance. Um, so basically what we do is we have a, a network of consultants that we work with that provide a, a variety of different types of expertise. Most often in our core area of work is grant writing, looking again at pretty significant and often federal funding applications. Um, and so we have that, that network that we cultivate annually, uh, but clients may also come to us with someone in their locality that has a real connection to the project and that would be a great fit to help them either work on grants uh, or provide some other type of technical assistance that is critical to accessing funding or to a grant application. So some of those types of technical assistance might look like uh, developing architectural renderings, potentially doing a feasibility study or a business plan or an economic analysis that is uh, required as part of a federal grant application. Um, and outdoor recreation, some examples might look like some GIS mapping of where trails might be so that way you have that to uh, put in with, with a grant application. Um, as funding allows, we can also support some post-award management time. So thinking about setting up systems so you can do a really great job at the reporting uh, when you've received a grant award. Um, and again, our, our priority goes uh, generally toward significant or large size. So over about $50,000 size grant applications, which are often federal, but some state applications may be eligible for our assistance as well. And also uh, we prioritize implementation funding. So uh, thinking about when the project is kind of ready to, to get started and get moving. Um, and, so, and then the other note that I'll just uh, make in this kind of section of our time together is that uh, the Ready program, again, as I mentioned, small but mighty, our, our awards are not super large. They range somewhere between um, about $1,500 to about $7,500, depending on the need. Those can, that, that funding, it acts as an award, but it goes directly toward consultant services, not toward kind of a line item in a particular project budget. Um, but there's no match requirement for that um, if folks are eligible and you know, complete all the steps to our application. Um, and so that funding, again, is, is designed for that targeted capacity at a certain stage of the project's life cycle and isn't really a fit for longer term project management support. So as, as Katie was mentioning, as you're thinking about ways to utilize funding that's coming in, potentially ARPA dollars or other types of funding and thinking about, wow, having some additional long-term capacity in our town or for our organization to really shepherd us through many types of funding sources, that, that is a great use for funding and isn't quite the right use uh, for ready funding, though we're a great uh, supporter at, at a various leg of your journey. So I'll leave it there um, and toss it back to Alyssa. Thank you so much, Mariah. And thank you to many tech supporters, hopefully our spotlighting of our speakers is working now. So we'll go from there. Um, and again, we're now on to the next leg of the journey. We're gonna hate this phrase by the end, but I think it is a great transition. So taking that more regional approach and thinking of those other partners, um, we're gonna turn to Meg again, coming from that regional development corporation, um, BDCC for that Southern portion of the state. But again, also thinking about what that corresponding is for you one is for your region. So we will go ahead and spotlight Meg. Thank you. 
Thanks so much. So, right, I'm Meg Staloff. Um, I am the program manager for the Southern Vermont Economy Project, so SVEP, because we love the, the acronyms, um, at BDCC, Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation. So BDCC is a regional development corporation. So there's 12 of them in the state. We work essentially by county, but there's 14 counties, so you do the math. Um, we, um, each RDC receives some funding from the state to do economic development, um, and that's used in different ways. So again, like depending on where you are, find out who the person is who fills my role. And I'm gonna say the role that I do is a little bit different. Um, I run a community program. So there's this understanding, even in like the New York Fed and, and like Tony Pippa, you know, like people were really good economists were like, hey, community development and economic development, rural communities, same thing. Um, they go hand in hand. We have to make our communities the place where people, we can't just create jobs, 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 business, 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 we also have to make our community places where people want and can live, right? So born out of that um, down here in Southern Vermont, um, which is you know a pretty long drive from the seat of power in our state, we kind of started working on this about 15 years ago and really building in community programs to our economic development work. So my program is actually funded in part by BDCC in part by Southern, Southeastern Vermont Economic Development Strategies, SEBIDS, which is a affiliate organization of BDCC, um, and the USDA uh, Rural Community Development Initiative, RCDI, uh, that funds my work. And I actually work in both Bennington and Wyndham counties. So um, if you're in Bennington County, you can also call us. So basically, what do we do? We build capacity for community projects to get done. So we're kind of like your your regional resources are your first line. I think we're your sure. first call um, that you're going to make. Um, right? We're the, we're the ones that are going to tell you what the next call is. So we're like, we're not going to solve your problem, but we're going to tell you who to call next. And most importantly, I think we'll help you get ready for that call. Because you know, I always tell people we we love to get focused questions so much, and and our partners at Ready and our partners at BLCT also love to get specific questions because that helps them answer your questions specifically. And and it's sort of the general questions take some time to hone down. So I think a lot of the work I do is helping communities get to the right question, and then get to the right person to ask that question of. So that's what we do. Um, how do we do that? We um, do capacity building trainings that are kind of more of those skills like, okay, we have, you know, grant management, grant writing, project management workshops that we've done. COVID silver lining, big time. A lot of those are uh, happened over Zoom and are on our website. So I'll drop a link into that. So even if you're not based in Southern Vermont, like please, you go check it out. There's a lot of good stuff on there um, that you could use. Um, and we do, you know, we're because I think one of the benefits of calling regional resources as kind of your first line of defense is that we could be very responsive. Um, and so we hear what's happening on the ground, like across our region, we know similar projects that are happening close by that you could literally like call them. And, you know, we make introductions, we bring people together into one room, we do a giant um, Southern Vermont Economy Summit every year at the end of May, which like, again, anyone can come if you want to drive to Wilmington please come. Um, but we uh, bring people together so that they can meet and they can share each other's knowledge and skills. Um, and so I think the, the backbone of work on a regional level is really helping project leaders think through the steps, um, you know, community engagement, grant writing management, project management, a lot of that behind the scenes work that goes into these projects, which um, take a long time, right? So um, I, I think that I guess I could sort of stop there because I'm saying in, in your region, there's someone who does this work and it, it might be different um, in, in, you know, my partners in Bennington County, for example, you have a Bennington, BCRC, Bennington County Regional Commission. They house both the RDC and the R Regional Planning Commission, RPC roll together under one roof, you know, in Rutland, their Regional Development Corporation is combined with their chamber in this really like innovative way it's like a powerhouse organization you know in the northeast kingdom you have a the northeast kingdom collaborative which is a nonprofit organization that's really based on doing a lot of this work similar work to what i do in southern vermont so that person is out there um in your 
region. And, you know, we, we don't have county government in Vermont. So that means we don't have like a structure that's been created for each county to follow. It gives us kind of a little more freedom and variation from county to county in how this work gets done. But there is this ecosystem, it does get done everywhere. So really, I would say your regional resources are your first line to call when you're kind of like in that idea phase or that, oh my gosh, we're lost at sea, we don't know what to do next. That's such a good person to call because we can say, all right, well, great. Well, here's here's some things you can do. Here's some things you can think about. And here's like the next person, like on here's the next person you're going to call. <laughs> We're going to give you their phone number and hook that. And we, we all talk to each other so we can also work together. So um, again, I, you know, I can't really speak beyond my region, but um, except for the ones that are like really close to us. But um, I know that person is out there for you. Um, so I guess I, you know, that's, yeah, I think that's sort of what I have. I'll drop a link in the chat to our website where you can find stuff um, that you please use our stuff, please. Um, and uh, I know that now we'll get a perspective from the people I always tell people to call all the time is your regional planning commission as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, and again, we're really going to kind of hammer home that regional point by moving right into the regional planning commission representative. Um, so we have Kevin Geiger here today, who I'll spotlight in just a moment. And I will commit um, from BCRD in our follow up. There are lists of all these people to help make sure that folks get connected. So again, recognizing we're talking at a kind of high level and alluding to that person for your region. There is a list, there is a map, there is a way to make sure that you get those connections. Um, so just want to say that in those follow up materials, know that in addition to this recording, um, um, there will be those resources so that they are available. Um, but last on our again list of regional friends, um, we're going to turn it over to Kevin um, from Two Rivers Ottawa Regional Commission. Great, thanks. Uh, so I'm Kevin Geiger. I'm the Director of Planning at the Two Rivers Ottawa Regional Commission, which is one of 11 regional planning commissions in Vermont. You're all covered by one. Um, if you want to figure out, if you don't know who you are um, and you want to figure out who covers you, you can go to VAPDA.org, V-A-P-D-A.org, which is the organization of all the regional planning commissions. I used to work in the last millennium. I used to work up north for the Northeast Kingdom as well. So what do we do? We help uh, communities primarily. So they're our main clients and we can help you find and write and manage grants. Uh, managing is important. Uh, so even, you know, very few grants arrive in duffel bags of cash in the night. They usually have uh, thick rules that come with them. So we re read those rules and help you understand them. The uh, most important thing and the most common thing I'd say we do with communities is we do municipal planning grants. And so those are commonly used to write town plans and zoning. Um, they come up every year. We help towns uh, write those and manage those. And they aren't just for that. They could be used for capital budgeting is a good thing. But I always plug town plans are a very good place to have a discussion about what you want to do. So if you're thinking of a project, it really should be in your town plan. It's not required to be, but that's the natural place to say, oh, we're gonna do such and such. The next place that we help towns is on community development block grant funding. So that CDBG funding comes from US HUD. Um, and that can be used for varieties of things. There's planning grants and there's project grants. I would say the biggest project grant we typically get involved with there are ADA improvements at public buildings. Um, so we've done ramps at libraries and that type of thing. Uh, we also do VTRANS grants. So uh, those things may be a bridge. We're managing salt sheds. We're managing uh, culvert projects for towns. So sometimes you're getting money and you're just like, we don't really, you know, we're glad we got this, but we don't want to manage the project. And so we might manage the project for you there. We also work on FEMA stuff, uh, both during disasters and and not during disasters. During disasters of Vermont Emergency Management are great people to call, but we can help you kind of wend your way through all the little odds and ends of FEMA land out there. Not during disasters, there are grants called, uh, there are two kinds of grants. There's the Flood Resilience Community Fund, I would say, out there. And that is for things um, that don't fit into FEMA very well. And those are pretty nice grants. They are 100% funding. Uh, then there's HMGP funding as well, which is a FEMA type of grant, has mitigation grant program funding. 
to do other things. Uh, they do buyouts. Uh, we do, you know, failed municipal infrastructure. It can't just be old. It has to have, be failing because of a disaster, that type of thing. Uh, and then lastly, I would say, uh, well, not two last things. We are involved in the MERP funding. That is the new funding through the uh, buildings and general services at the state to look at thermal needs of town. So this is think we have a town building, a fire station, something like that out there. And it's got an old oil furnace in there. We want to get rid of the fossil fuel thing and we want to go to a heat pump or something. There are planning grants, assessment grants, and then implementation grants coming all around that type of thing over the next year. And that's where um, we are contracted with the state to help towns find and, and try to access that money. And then we do special grants. There may be a dam removal. There may be a trails project. You name it, all sorts of odds and ends out there that we can get involved with. And so we're pretty good at trying to figure out, oh, that's your project. This is where you should go for grants. I do want to say, um, and I'll probably repeat myself later, that uh, if you haven't worked with your select board on the grant, you need to, because when we respond to towns asking us for help, the town is best uh, represented by the town manager or the select board or somebody who is actually in charge and can sign a grant agreement when all gets said and done. So uh, make sure that if you're not them, that you're working with them, because that's going to be one of the first questions. And make sure that the project has um, support. And again, back to that town plan. That's a great place to be talking about everything you're going to be doing in the next eight years. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Kevin. I was really hoping for that treasure map to the duffels of cash, cash in the grants, but uh, seeing as we don't have that, we're glad that we have 70 of us spending our time here today to think about uh, what the other ways to get there really are. So thank you all. I think, again, that was kind of our high level introduction. So talking about, you know, I hope folks, maybe it feels a little overwhelming, but also are hearing that even if they come with an acronym, there is support out there and there is a number of programs and these enthusiastic qualified folks who would like to think with you about what your project is and how to make it a reality. So to move us maybe a little out of that more hypothetical space and into kind of, okay, on the ground, me as a community leader, maybe working with my town or my select board, um, what that kind of looks like. I'm gonna now go back to all of the panelists and have them kind of talk maybe more specifically about a project. It doesn't need to be naming names, but an example of, so how has this actually worked out? Um, maybe you got a phone call from a community or were able to work really effectively with a partner. Um, so what's an example of that and why did it work so well? What maybe information did a community have coming in that really made their partnership or utilization of resources really effective. Um, so we'll head back to Katie to see if you have anything to speak to in kind of that regard. Oh my gosh, you're gonna catch me off guard. I was looking at my notes that I didn't pull up in time for this. Um, one of them is a community um, on the islands who is doing a water and wastewater project. And they came to us, we did a consult on call with them. It was, it was Bonnie who worked with them and we were able to, um, make some connections for the project that the community itself maybe wouldn't have been able to make, but given how um, we have worked with funding before and the ways that, you know, was it, who, who was it? Was it Meg that said community and economic development are this, that's the same thing in Vermont? Well, demonstrating that there was an economic development component to this particular project pointed them in the direction of a funding source that they maybe wouldn't necessarily have gone to, but for, drilling down deeper and asking the more questions about the project. Um, that's, that's one specific example, but oftentimes, and I'm sure everybody on this panel will agree that when you start to ask those questions and drill down on the project, there are really multiple aspects of a single project, right? So let's just say a, a town hall project as an example. If it's in an old building, there's historic preservation money that you could chase for that. There could be drainage issues. There could be stormwater money that you could chase for that. There could be, you know, once you start drilling down on what the, the various facets of the project are, you can start to pull out other funding sources that get you closer to having a more funded 
project and less of it being raised on the backs of taxpayers or through fundraising other means if it's a community project. Um, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm sorry, my, I'm gonna have to think of my second example, but if I can come back around to it of a real life town that we've helped, um, if I can come in and do cleanup, that would be great. At the absolutely, end. absolutely. And I'm combining <laughs> questions on the fly because there's so much awesome thinking from all of the panelists, but um, I will move on over to Mariah to see if you have an example of a successful community project partnership. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it also, this one kind of hits on a couple of things that, that folks have been saying. So I, I love being on these calls. I feel like I learned so much and I, I'm taking so much into conversations that I'll have with communities as well. But um, this example, um, basically, uh, you know, it's was a community hub in a small town. So, you know, met all of our kind of base eligibility requirements, which is kind of part one of, of how well a given resource can help you is just also connecting with them, whether it's a you know technical assistance resource or whether it's a grant funder or some organization that's in between, just really connecting with them to, to show how you meet their requirements is, is obviously kind of layer one. Um, but so that was really helpful that this was just a clearly, you know, kind of a slam dunk for what our mission and focus areas are as, as our base under statute. So um, community center that was meeting a variety of community needs, honestly, quite a complex project in lots of different infrastructure pieces, historic preservation pieces, um, community buy-in and engagement had already been done. And they were really coming to us um, for uh, support with a, a pretty large federal grant um, through the community development block grant program, which is federal funds that flow through Vermont, through the Vermont Community Development Program. So that's a great place for folks to start as well, have conversations with the VCDP team, Vermont Community Development Program team, early and often to see if your community is eligible for that support, because they have a variety of grants. Some are smaller, some are much larger for infrastructure. So that's just a note there that that's worth uh, digging into. Um, but so they they came to us and they, so a couple layers of, of what was just really effective about as well as lots of other folks' resources, um, is that though there were lots of different aspects to this project, they had a, a clear leadership team that was moving those pieces forward and, and you know, keeping folks on task, working with larger conglomerations of their community to keep pieces moving forward. And they selected a team lead that was going to work on you know, the fundraising aspect. And that was the person that was my contact, though there were lots of people involved and potentially lots of names on email chains, selecting someone to really take the ball forward in that lane is extremely helpful. And I would argue in kind of each phase of a project that that is super helpful. So it was great. We had really good communication. Um, I would also say uh, that they, they came in really prepared with lots of documentation already developed about the project and, and kind of where they had been so far and specifically what type of assistance they were looking for. I think Meg had kind of chimed in on this earlier as well, but, um, you know, working with those earlier stage resources to really develop whatever that project case or need statement is, is a very, very valuable time spend because then you have, even if it's a paragraph on a Word doc that you can send around to all of, you know, folks like us on this call or a variety of other organizations, it really helps us drill down into what is your project, what is the assistance you need. And how can we help you? And that's it. The quicker that we can get to that lane, that makes the process a lot more efficient and allows us to really all um, kind of come together to, to support you. We all really love to work together and we just need to know what you need and who is the best organization to provide it. So that was super helpful that they came in really clear with what their project was, what their need was, and specifically what their need from Ready was, which was to really, we need some support specifically with this grant. Um, you know, we have some capacity here locally, but some, of course, many communities that we work through ready with um, have less capacity than this particular group did. But that's all to say that they still felt like we just do not have the capacity for this particular grant. We don't know how to fit our project into that mold. And so, like, can you please support us with uh, with all of this process around this? And so that's what we were able to do and connect them with a, a consultant that expertise in that. Um, and then. Uh, yeah, I think the other thing I'll, I'll say is that uh, grant writing is a team sport. This is my favorite phrase for, for the, the, the pocket that I always bring out. Um, and that even with any sort of support that you're receiving from an organization, again, whether it's grant writing or potentially other types of assistance, it really requires a community to, to have the time and space and energy to commit, even if they don't have that expertise. You know, our, our assistance providers really need that participation because we don't know your community as well. As you do. We don't know the project as well as you do. What we can help you do is, is be able to 
take that project to uh, two different organizations and really present it and use the language that funders want to see and, and show how that project is gonna further their goals. So that way we can help you access some funds. Um, but that, you know, no consultant can just, you know, magically out of thin air, come up with the exact right project statement. That's really gonna require a team effort. And, and with this particular project that I was mentioning, that team lead along with the folks that they are working with were really successful at um, being a team within that and also uh, being really uh, communicative and clear about what their needs were. So um, I'll leave it there for now and pass it on, but, but yeah, thank you. I heard a lot of communicate early and often and think maybe that is a, is a life lesson. I see a lot of nodding heads on the screen. Um, we will head over to Meg for additional examples of successful partnerships with the local project. Okay, so I'm gonna like go way back um, before you would like, I'm gonna take you like to the community project that Mariah mentioned, um, like before they got to Mariah, where they were prepared, way back to the beginning. So you have a community project, you wanna do something, you start tugging at the string and you realize that there's a lot of different people involved in this project. So let's just say I'm taking an, this is like an in progress example that like is in progress now. This community, they decided they want to prioritize, um, you know, they did some, their ARPA committee did some work in talking about um, community priorities and things they want to do. And they landed on that we've got this historic meeting house and we really could be using it more better differently to enhance our community. And gosh, it's got a library in it, but like we are libraries and doing as much as it could. And like, oh, there's all these things. And, oh my gosh, there's all these people involved. So when you started going down the list and you're like, okay, we've got the town that owns it. We've got the Friends of Committee that used to own it, but still stay involved and have some money for it. We've got the um, library. Um, we've got our ARPA committee. And then of course we have our select board. And like already we're like, okay, that's five community groups that are somewhat overlapping that are involved in this project. So so what we we kind of talked a little bit and, and what they have decided to do is like, let's have a meeting and get everybody to just like meet in a couple of Saturdays and just like walk around the building all together, people from all these different organizations and just like talk about like what's possible um, and what we want and what the goals are for this project. So a lot of what I do with communities is literally sitting down and saying, okay, let's look at your town plan and the goals that are in there. Let's look at the uh, comprehensive economic development strategy that says that's for our region. What are some of the goals that are in there? What are some of the things that like you can just say about your community specifically that you want to see? Uh, and let's just like get all those goals together and mash them up and, and highlight which are the most important ones. And then how does this project complete these goals? And how do we fold in all the different interests of all these different groups? Even within this very small town, we've got five groups that are involved in this project and like they should all stay involved, but also how are we gonna figure out who's gonna do what piece of this, how are we going to work together? And then also come up with sort of a goal statement that says we are doing this project because it meets this community need and goal that we see that's linked to our town plan, that's linked to the community, you know, that says the comprehensive economic development strategy for the region and linked to all these you know, different organizations in our town that want to work together to make this happen. And like right there, boom, now, now I'll tell you who to call for the next step. Like, right, that is a really important, that's kind of the very early stage planning work that you need to do. I also wanna say people are like, oh gosh, we haven't even done that yet. And there's all this federal funding. Are we gonna miss out? You know what? You are not because you have to do this work. Like you literally cannot skip this step. So if you use some of your ARPA funds to do this work, when, like when, like federal funding isn't gonna like disappear in 2026, right? Like these are programs that have been around for a long time. There is more money now. So I'm not gonna say don't use it, to, but if you need to use some of this money to do the planning work, fantastic. I think that's really like, don't skip this step. You, you, you have to not, you, you have to do this work. So that's just an example recently of like, sort of that's what we do. That's some of the questions we ask that I ask is like, well, who are all the groups that are involved? Have you ever had a meeting with all of them all together? Like, and is there something like, is your select board, again, the select board thing, I'm like, is your select board aware of this? Have you talked to them about it? Even if it's not owned by the town, your select board should know. And 
when was the last time you looked at your town plan? So these are questions that we ask, um, but I think that's just a, an example of kind of um, great work that communities can do. And that's sort of the work you need to do to get started. And it's worth doing and don't feel like you're missing the boat because you're not like ready to apply for federal funds right away. Like you'll be ready when you're ready and you, you have to be ready. <laughs> so, so do that work within your community. And so that when you go and then finally, like I'll send people to, to Mariah, like, okay, now you're ready, ready. And you have, your statement and you know what you're doing and you know exactly how she can help you she's like there to give you the help but like she may send you a way to get more ready if you're not ready and that's fine um you know she'll send you to me she'll send you to regional planning commission she'll send you to that the, the right person for you so that's what i say a lot of times regional resources are the people that help you get ready to take that next step on the journey and don't feel discouraged if that's where you are because it's super no project will succeed without that background work. And um, so that's kind of what we do. And so I love it when a community, we, we tug those strings and get everyone to sit down at the table um, and really listen. And, and you know, we use a lot of like sticky pads and, and you know, markers and people giving input from all directions. And then we like sift it all down and try and make sense of it. Awesome. So that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you so much, Meg. And again, that communication and coordination, even on that super local level, super early, you know, understanding just how much having folks in a room together can sometimes really build consensus or help clarify, oh, I would thought we were talking about a totally different room or a totally different project, or did you know this history of a place? Um, some great pieces. So wrapping up that regional perspective, we'll head over to Kevin. Thanks. Oops. I muted you, Kevin. Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> we, we, I think we did each other right at the same time there. Um, so one of the projects that's a physical project that I, I'm glad to be part of is if you're at downtown White River Junction and you look up and you see this kind of semi-triangular uh, silverish building that's about four stories tall, that is uh, commercial on the first floor and then residential above it. That's Bridge and Main. And so we did handled that project with the town. The town came to us, so they were ready, willing, and able. Um, to do that project, but they needed somebody to manage the money and to do all the little paperwork that isn't in that duffel bag. Um, and so we were able to do that. And so now, you know, there's a nice brand new building in the downtown. I would say uh, uh, my another project is the our area-wide planning study in Randolph for a couple of properties, including the Branchwood site that, that the town actually owns. And um, and there I'm going to talk about brownfields for a second, because if you're thinking about doing a project and it's not in a building that's already there, and even perhaps if it is in a building that exists, you probably need to work on brownfields. That site probably has issues if it's in any type of downtown out there, and you're going to need to go through that. So um, in that project, we were able to partner with the town and the town's crew and do public visioning around that site. So we're now we have uh, drawings and some schematics and some rough numbers on potential reuses for that site um, that the town actually owns, which was a previous factory that burned down. And that's, I think, one of the things that many of these partners uh, can bring to your town is if you haven't done all those little steps, which is common, there needs to be a facilitated community discussion that takes care and skill. It's not just a, hey, I'll come to the meeting and, and, and we'll write, start writing stuff down. If you don't have a skilled community facilitator, which might be your town moderator, um, to run that discussion and come up with things because it, it takes a little while to boil it down. It's not just, you know, we're going to go get pizza. Like what kind of pizza? How many pizzas? What size pizza? You're going to, you need all of those things to get boiled down because when you get to the funding agency, they want to know the details. And um, so again, I would say calling various parts of us to come in and have that community discussion is good. But the um, Branchwood site, I'm very excited to see what that happens with that. Randolph, we can we have pictures of what it might be out there, but Bridge in Maine, if you want to go see something that's built right now. Well, wonderful example. It feels like real buildings are maybe as close as we get to the real pot of cash is uh, something tangible you can really see in the grounding communities. Um, so I'm going to go back to Katie. I know you had some final and also just we'll go through all the panelists one more time, just if folks have kind of one or two closing thoughts. So it's bringing us right about to 11. We're going to open it up to Q&A after that. 
already seen some great comments um, in the chat. So we'll facilitate going through those with the panelists. But um, again, if there's kind of one final thought or takeaway um, for our community leaders on the call and, and how they might interact with you or anything like that, um, we'll start off with Katie. Awesome, thank you. And so <laughs> I really appreciate you circling back. It was, uh, so the, the first project I talked about was that big project, right? We also do teeny tiny little projects like my other example is the town of Roxbury. They wanted a uh, radar speed feedback sign. You know, the signs that tell you how fast you're going because they had some traffic coming issues they needed to address. So um, we were able to work with them and find them with the resource for that. And so nothing is too small, nothing is too big. If it is big, we refer out to the great partners that are on the call today or beyond. Um, and ask questions. And I really want to go back to what Meg said about being prepared, because nothing is worse than writing a grant application, which takes a ton, ton, ton of time to do and not getting funded because you weren't prepared. And a funder gets so many applications that are highly, it's highly competitive. And so you need to put your best foot forward, which means you have brought your community together. You've got everyone in support. If it is not a municipal project, then having a letter of support from your local government is always a great thing to have, even if they're not a funder in the project. They might have to be a funder in the project because one of the funding sources is a federal grant opportunity that municipalities are only eligible for. I think Kevin and actually Kevin, Meg and Mariah all mentioned community development block, block grant. The town is the recipient for that, whether or not they're the ones who actually use the money or they subgrant it to the, the project itself, um, get your town support. It will launch you further in your process rather than working in opposition to your local government, make them your partner, go early and often, talk to them, tell them about your project, pitch your project to them so that they feel like whether they are intimately involved in it or they are just aware of it, they're going to have to touch it in some way. And you want to build that support. If not, it, it's going to become a big, hard local conversation to have. And you might fail in the final stages. And it's really heartbreaking when that happens. So um, my, my best takeaway advice from the league is make your local government your partner, regardless of what role they play in the project. And do that as early, right at the seed stage is great. And uh, go from there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mariah. Thank you. That's awesome, Katie. Thank you for, for sharing that as well. Um, so yeah, just a couple kind of takeaways uh, that would, I would love to share. Um, so overall, uh, you know, I, I work mainly in the grant space. Um, and I just want to note, because I've had many of these conversations with communities, with organizations, municipalities, like across the board of our clientele recently, um, that, you know, funders are not Oz, as Katie was mentioning, like, go talk to them. It's, it's all the same people. We all work together in, in Vermont. I think we're really lucky that everything is hyper-localized. Like you really can talk to someone at the USDA that's really focused on Vermont and that, or at a variety of levels. And, you know, Northern Border Regional Commission, same thing. Like there are a variety of funders out there um, and they want to talk to you. They want to hear from you. They want to understand your project. And it's really, really important to connect with them early to figure out if you're not only eligible, but are you competitive that round? Is, is there already a pipeline of projects ahead of you that no matter how good your grant application is, it's not a good fit this round, but it'll look really good in the next cycle. And so how do you strategize based on that? And funder groups are really, really great at being very transparent about that kind of information. Um, the other piece, and again, I've had this conversation a few times recently, so I felt like it was fitting to share, is that if you are not successful with an application, whether you feel like you put in a ton of work or maybe just kind of slap something together and you think, ah, like I, I get why I didn't get it. You know, I understand. Always call the funder and ask why you were not funded, why that application wasn't successful, because that will help you um, leagues, uh, you know, improve your application by leagues when you apply either again to that funding source or when you look at other funding sources. I also let folks know, uh, you know, you can recycle your content. None of us are upset if you recycle content for, for grant applications. We love that, but do make sure it's really specific to that funder, because really um, what funders are looking for is, you know, they give you the score sheet. They want you to repeat the language back to them. Uh, and so really making sure that, yes, you know, you can recycle content. Don't don't throw away great stuff that you've created in the past, but just make sure it's really targeted to that particular funding source. 
and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Mariah. I saw Vermont is small but mighty in the comments, so really reflecting that, that local energy and accessibility. Um, Meg, any closing thoughts? I mean, kind of what they all said, um, but right, do your homework. So go find all the, go find your town plan. We'll have a five. If you don't have a town plan, get it done. Like <laughs> work with your community. Um, or if you your town plan doesn't accord with other community goals, like maybe, you know, call your planning commission and talk about your local planning commission and your regional planning commission. Like so go look at the planning documents that exist, right? Because they're there and they're helpful. And right, again, I say, talk to the select board, talk to your select board. Like somebody needs to sign this grant agreement and it's gotta be someone that they know is not going anywhere. So even if it's like the select board chair, if that's not the same human in three years, there will be another human that takes that position. So like make sure that there's someone who can, there's a someone who's in a position that will exist regardless that's gonna be that project lead. Um, and just, yeah, just like, you know, communicate, um, look at planning documents, do your homework, you know, a great thing to do. And like, again, call the funder, call the funder, call the funder. Like I like some grants even advertise kind of a pre-flight call, like before you apply, you have to call us or, um, you know, sort of check in. I love that. I love, I love that being sort of institutionalized um, because it really helps and they can help you guide through and again, say, well, you know, maybe you're not quite ready and that's fine. Here's what you would need to be ready. Please come back next year, please. You know, we want you to stay in touch. Um, that's not a bad message. Um, and yeah, so, and then also like a good way when you're looking to see if something is a good fit, like before you call the funder, please read through the grant requirements, see if you can decide if you're qualified or not. Um, and if you have questions about it, then call them and ask them. And also take a look at the recently funded projects page. That is amazing because then you can see like, oh, are they funding things that are like, it's that'll help you. It's like scope and scale and amount. So how much money do we need? How big is this project? Just to make sure that you're like in the right ballpark because maybe this isn't the right fit for you. So I always say like that's sort of before you call people, before you call the funder, make sure that your project is as in line as, as possible. And then if you have some like little questions, then they can really answer those. But but you know, you can do that homework. They put that information out there. I know it's time consuming, but a lot of times, you know, that's what I do is to send people, here's all the links you're gonna need to do your homework, go forth and do the homework. So you can at least call someone regional who can like at least do that like you know, Google research for you and be like, go here, 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 and then that'll, and then call the funder. Um, so I think that's just sort of, I think really all that, like, and, and also I'm going to say, think about talking to your select board. A select board is much more comfortable making a decision or committing funding or getting behind something when they see like four or five people a meeting or 12 people at a meeting than if one person is at the meeting. So also like, feel free to come bring your friends, like in a, in a loving and not a confrontational way, but to say, to show community support, like walk the walk of showing your government that when they're making that decision, they are a citizen that is volunteering their time. And when they make decisions, they want to feel comfortable that that decision is the right decision for the community and that they're not going to have eggs thrown at their house or, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, um, they, they, the more you can show them that there is a lot of support for this project and it's something that really matters to it, then it makes it like, they're like, great, you know, they feel, come think how you would feel sitting in their seat and and help them um, be partners in your project and help them see um, that there's community support for this in a way that really feels good, not in a confrontational way at all, but just to say, hey, look how many people really care about this. This is something that is great for our community. Um, they love when people come to select board meetings. We do, Meg. Yeah. So just having to say, yeah. as a select board member, I will just affirm that things about the select board is also not Oz. We are uh, community members in your community, so feel free to contact us. We do get a lot of emails, so understand you may need to be persistent in your communication. And also that even better than Meg said, bringing friends to a meeting. Also, it's really great to know about a project before you're being asked to sign on the dotted line and fund it. So ideally, that theme of early and often communication that we've heard about, it could just be a, hey, a group of us are starting to think about this project and we just wanted you to know because maybe there's some important context you can provide. So I do want to make sure we leave space for Kevin because I really appreciate him joining us on the panel. I want to make sure we get that voice represented as well. And then we'll hop to questions. Katie, did you have something to add though? As the VLCT rep, you do also get a plug if you'd like one. 
No, I was just going to say um, we are in the process of drafting a document that's the before the grant, which addresses, Alyssa, what you just said as a select board member and what I was saying before, early, go in early. So some tips on how to prepare your project and then start the local conversation with your local officials about the project so that you can, and because a lot of folks don't really even, don't put it together. Oh my God, I have to talk to the town about it. You know, and how can you do that successfully? Here's some best practices and tips to help you along the way. So that'll be a resource on our website coming up. Sorry. Yeah. Great. And last shameless plug, we also actually did a VCLM workshop like this about communicating with local officials, which I spoke on. Um, and so that is recorded and available on the website if folks are curious to hear from other people too. But I will give last word to Kevin on uh, things to share with our leaders. Uh, sh sure. Um, since nobody has mentioned yet, I'd say talk with your select board, right? <laughs> Right. That's what we're all saying. Select boards are there and select boards have seasons. There's no sense in coming to them in June and saying, oh, I need $10,000 that they didn't put in their budget last November. So you want to think about those things well ahead in time. I would say every project should have some level of local funding involved because that means they're serious. If the select board is not willing to give you a hundred bucks, then they probably don't like your project. Um, and so, you know, there's there's going to be money out there. The other thing that somebody else mentioned is uh, grants have rules. And if the grant application says it needs to be on purple paper and triplicate, don't go. That's crazy. Go. We're getting some purple paper. Um, the, whatever they're doing, just do the, they gave you an instruction sheet for a reason. Just follow that little instruction sheet. This is not time to, you know, be E.E. E. Cummings and be creative here. This is time to just follow the rules and get the stuff in because it makes their end of reading your application so much easier. And that helps you along the way. And, uh, and talk to your select board, just in case we haven't covered that. Awesome. Sounds great. Well, thank you all. Um, thank you to our panelists. I don't know if we want to give them a virtual round of applause um, or something like that, but really thank all of them for amidst juggling all of these types of inquiries, also taking this time to be here with all of us this morning and share. I know there has already been some great questions in the chat, so we're going to go through a couple of those and then open up the floor. Um, so thank you all for sticking around to, to have that time. One I did want to just start with right off is we got a question about the Vermont Community Development Association. So not to put my colleague Jenna on the spot, but she is the president of their board. So I didn't know if she had anything uh, to add briefly to the response there about who they are and what they do. Yeah, thanks, Lissa. And thank yeah, Gretchen, who's our treasurer, um, <laughs> answered that, that question, which is great. But yeah, the Vermont Community Development Association is an association of folks working in community and economic development in Vermont. And we um, have members that are municipalities, community organizations, RDCs, RPCs, individuals. It's a broad um, membership and we hold two events a year. And a sneak peek is that the spring conference coming up soon is gonna focus on recreation and economic vitality. Um, so keep an eye out for that. We'll share that to our community leadership network list as well. So you should receive that in your email. Great, thank you. So heading back, one of the earlier questions we had was about funding streams. And Kevin, I don't want to target this specifically to you, but it does specifically name RPCs. Um, and the question one is about if there's funding streams available to RPCs to add capacity to help um, field all of oh. these new requests. But also that same question about towns as well, specifically because it's um, kind of the needs for grant administration. So I think acknowledging, I know there's some ongoing legislative things and maybe touching on those briefly, but if there's any specific efforts around um, RPCs and then also that town increased capacity. Yes, in fact, uh, I think I saw an RFP yesterday that came out around that uh, building rural capacity. I'm not sure exactly the acronym they're calling it, but um, that will be available. Uh, RPCs are gonna apply to, to get some of that money, um, which would, bolster us because you know typically if we're managing a project we're doing it under contract yeah you know, we we need to be funded to to help you go get things um we can start with our own money but if we're really involved in a project it'll it'll take funding and that particular funding will give us capacity to to provide uh, it to communities that is going to be targeted to communities of need and so we're waiting for actually that list of communities um around there but but um, but that will give us some new resources, yeah. And and just to add, I dropped the RFP in the chat. 
the link to the RFP. And I want to say that um, municipalities themselves could also directly apply for funds. Um, it's a $3 million pot that just became available. Um, so both service providers such as your RPCs or uh, whoever is going to enter into the ring to get funded there will come in as contractors slash consultants, but municipalities could also direct apply for funding too. It's a 29-page um, RFP, but if you're interested, worth reading. So. Thank you very much. Um, and I already now have some reading to do and maybe we'll follow the advice on this webinar and maybe contact some of you to talk through how that might apply to a specific community. Um, we had some questions about um, list of programs around the state for each reason region. I think some of that had to do with the RPCs and RDCs. So again, knowing some of those chats um, links, excuse me, were added in the chat and also will be in the follow-up material. Um, we had a question about, does Katie or our regional planning commission assist with community conversations? I, I know we do. Uh, mm. I think VLCT does, VCRD does. A lot of us can come in on an ad hoc basis and just do that one-off facilitation. That's pretty easy. If you called me up and said, I need you in Tunbridge tonight, I can kind of go do that. It's the longer community conversations that just like any other project take time and lead up. And so that, that that needs a little work, but if um, but certainly I've done it for Pittsfield's town hall or Chelsea's public buildings, you name it. Um, we are pretty adept at coming in and having that because and it's sometimes it's useful to have somebody who's not from your community to do that because they don't have a dog in the fight, right? I'm going to say too. We my program has started doing that a little bit too on a local basis. So I see Karen here from Wardsboro. We did kind of come in and do a meeting with community stakeholders in Wardsboro. I'm going to Halifax tomorrow, and it's really a very like high level, early level type of conversation. So I'm like, this is not a decision making conversation, but like we my program has been doing this community assessment and project prioritization project process where we really just come in and and sort of say hey let's invite a bunch of people to get together let's work on you know including town government people and just come as a community member and we kind of try and shake out um you know some some goals and some take this these huge lists of laundry lists of projects that may have come out of like an ARPA process and say well which one of these really matter and really achieve these goals. So that'll give you some direction. See you later, here's who to call next. So that's my, if you're in um, Bennington or Wyndham counties, we do that. Um, and I would say we would push it out more to the RPC or the RDC since they are on the ground and they know their communities intimately um, to have those broader community discussions. I know I frequently will present to um, local officials, you know, about ARPA, God, I feel like I did it. <laughs> ARPA 101 to almost, you know, probably 75% of the towns in the state, just that high level understand, base knowledge understanding. Um, and then when it drills down to the community level where residents are starting to participate in the conversation and it grows outside of the local government, I do feel like the RPCs and the RDCs are really great. They have their finger on the pulse of their communities and are able to be great listeners and then provide great feedback based on their knowledge and experience of the area. So I, when you make you say high level, I'd say we're in a higher level above that. So it's like base knowledge and then it goes down to the local level um, where you need the finger on the pulse, but I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing a question about more info on the rural focus mentioned at the top of the meeting, um, which I believe maybe Mariah, I don't know if there's anything else you can add to just given that rural is in your program name. And so maybe a little more elaboration there on what qualifies. Yeah, absolutely. And, and maybe that question is more general. So the person is welcome to, to add on to that question to be more specific. But for us, for the Rural Economic Development Initiative, um, our definition of small rural is uh, 5,000 in population for a municipality or less, um, but there are different definitions of that. For instance, if you are working with uh, the USDA around a federal grant or loan, they have a variety of definitions of rural, one of which is like basically anything under 50,000 people, which is almost all of Vermont except for the metro areas. So again, it just will depend a little bit on this particular program that you're looking at as to what that rural definition is. I know it is a little messy. So we're always happy to, again, all of our organizations are happy to work together and figure out who's who's a great fit to, to support you. 
Awesome. I do want to give a chance if anyone on the call um, wasn't able to put something in the chat and wants to either raise a hand using the Zoom function or just go ahead and unmute yourself um, for additional questions. They've answered everything. Everyone feels good to go on next steps for their community project. Um, right. Um, I have a couple more in the chat, so I do want to go up. We did have a question from Matthew about navigating around Act 250. Matthew, I don't know if you have anything else specifically to add. Um, I will say, I know that's a question we could probably spend another hour and a half on. Yes, um, so yes, thank you. Response. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yes, yes. That's uh, that's in a broader context because that's between that's a problem that we have across out building out uh, what we need to do moving forward because that's actually one of the uh, Hinder it, such as say, or one of the sticking points because, or sticking or sticky points because when we try to build out new projects, projects or things, it we're trying to make sure that we don't activate that or it doesn't automatically activate 250, which is also a problem building out what we want within our communities because they're just stipulation and guidance, you know, and how can we navigate that or how can we make it, you know, more flexible to get our projects done without actually trying to go through that uh, Act 250 in general, because that's very, that slows most projects down, is that Act 250 barrier that the state is looking at that very seriously, because that's what's stopping our progress moving forward. So how can we all navigate around that together? Thank you. It's much more a broad concept, but that question needs to be, you know, spoke to about or have discussion about because it's it's part of, you know, the land, you know, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. I think we really hear you. And I think there's probably a number of folks on this call who may be through various hats um, or roles. Uh, that's something you're thinking about. Kevin, did you want to respond specifically? Or? Yeah, because um, we get involved. Our PCs are all uh, parties to all like 250s. Uh, first off, most Act 250s just go through Lake Butter. Um, and that's because they're good projects. And so if it complies with the regional plan and it complies with the town plan and it's something the zoning works, all of those things line up. Um, it's it's And it's, you know, not building in the middle of the swamp and all the other things that you don't want to do. Usually an Act 250 goes right through it. Where we see problems with Act 250s are when they're trying to go um, somewhere where the plans don't have them go. Um, so I will say most of the time a well thought project is goes along. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Amanda about what public resources are available to follow up on funded projects. And Amanda, I don't know if you have anything to add more specifically, um, or if anyone wants to take a stab at that. I can, I can add a little more specifics to that. I'm just looking to, I'm, I'm just a community member and I'm sort of trying to track down where funding has gone um, since 2019. There's some projects in my town that were funded and I was really excited to find that out, but I don't see any progress or reports. And so I'm just trying to get some access to resources that are publicly available to community members um, that I can sort of track that. And that's that's my question, thank you. I can, um, I, my follow-up question is, um, are they municipal projects or are they community projects, right? So if it's a municipal project, the municipality would have all of the financials on the projects that are uniquely their projects, right? So if it's a, um, if it's a town asset, then they will have all of that information for the town. If it's a community project, like, I'll give an example, it's near and dear to my heart. I'm a part of a local nonprofit and we did a general store project. And so that's money spent in my community, but it's not a town project, it's a local project and it's a nonprofit project. And so if you are trying to aggregate all of the dollars that are being spent in your community, municipal, you know, capital T, town government and smaller lowercase t community projects, I don't think that there's one tool that aggregates that that I'm aware of, I would love to be educated. Yeah, I would just say, I think you have to kind of just 
know who the project leader was and ask them directly um, where that project is because maybe they did they received funding that was maybe it was planning work and they've done that planning work and so you're not like directly seeing the progress of that project but in fact it's going it's background work so I think um, you may have to directly speak to um, the leaders of that project. And at the state level, I know they track funding by geographic distribution. However, if there's multiple different funding sources from different pots, that's not all aggregated together at the state level yet. I would imagine they're going to move towards that as their systems get more sophisticated, but I don't think they're there yet in terms of doing that at the state level for state and federal money as it relates to geographic distribution and aggregating the data. We also had a question from Daniel on some of his um, sense of consulting work and kind of how to engage with communities. Um, I would just offer, I don't know where you live, Daniel, um, but I would say feel free to, we already mentioned, uh, go to a local meeting and see what's happening just in your own communities. Um, I often say community volunteers, whether it's on the select board or just something like a planning commission or maybe an energy committee are often some of your most engaged community members. They're already choosing to volunteer their time um, to help support your community. So even if they don't relate directly to maybe the type of work you're doing, those are often great connector folks in just a local community who could maybe help connect you with um, someone else who's doing a type of project. Um, and I would also just offer that folks who are talking on the call today, um, maybe those equivalents, again, thinking about um, who are other folks doing work in the state who might be able to know more about the type of work you're doing um, and how it might fit into potential projects. Um, anyone have anything else to add yeah. on that? Alyssa, I can I can do a quick follow up there um, from the ready lens, which is that, you know, if folks um, have a particular, you know, expertise, whether it's in a grant writing background, a fundraising background, feasibility background or you know, donor campaign fundraising, um, those are skill sets that we need a lot more of here in Vermont. Um, the ready network, uh, we have, like, as I mentioned before, a variety of consultants. Um, that are in different parts of the state that have a variety of different skill sets and expertise. We run an annual request for qualifications each year. Um, it's also open on a rolling basis, but we kind of usually around July time kind of do a, a little bit more outreach around it, but it's always available. Um, and we have, um, I can put a link to that in the chat as well. So if there are folks who on the call may have a particular set of expertise or, or have a little consulting business on the side, then they'd like to engage in communities um, in that way um, and potentially be paid by the Ready program. I uh, always love to put that plug in. So please feel free to reach out about that. Thanks so much, Mariah. Um, it seems like we have time for maybe one more. Does anyone have a last burning question um, for our panelists while they're here? I just want to say there was a, a question that got yeah. dropped into the chat. I don't know if anyone, yeah. I can't take that on, but maybe someone else. Yes, and this got missed. Uh, thanks, Meg, for highlighting and thanks, Karen, for asking. So we had a question about how will our panelists and organizations interact with the Secretary of Administration's planned Rural Infrastructure Assistance Program um, if it goes live. And I believe that's referring to a state program, but panelists, please fill in because I can't speak to this yeah, either. <laughs> yeah, that's the one that uh, Katie and I were talking about earlier. Um, so I know from our side, RPCs will be applying to, to get that money. Um, and uh, at least our RPC, but I think all our RPCs in general, to be get that money to, to give us capacity. But it is, it's not just a pipe to RPCs, as, as Katie said. It, towns can apply themselves um, and get that and did you did you put the link in there i did put the link in the chat i also um want to just call out that um it references an underserved community index yes. and that so if you get in the weeds of it if you score on 75 percent or higher on this index then you if you're in the top 25 percent of that you'll receive priority funding so it's it's really serving communities with the most need. And I believe the state is putting together the index based on a series of metrics that sort of drill down on capacity level. Um, and so is it for every town in the state? It is not. It is for um, a select group of towns and it is on a first come first serve basis. 
So when the consultants are hired, those towns can go to that consultant and get services or towns that wanna go directly to the RFP and seek funding directly for themselves if they are on the index um, and they meet the eligibility requirements per um, the RFP, then they will receive priority prioritization for the funding. Um, as they move through the funding, if there's funding that's remaining after they've gone through the index towns, then obviously the state will grant that out. Um, but priority is for those towns. And I think based on what I've seen for the index, it works out to be about 61 towns. Um, and then so the 25 percentile there would be about 15 towns. So I just wanted to make sure that folks were aware of that caveat around the funding because it it, it does matter. So, and as we were talking about earlier, you want to identify those, oh, I found this grant program. It's like, oh, great. You actually aren't really eligible. Right, or you are eligible, but you're way down the list. So do you wanna focus your energy there? Or maybe you wanna just track this grant, see who's getting funded, wait and see if there's money left over and keep that as a backup plan for the future as you chase and prioritize other funding and other grant opportunities. But this one's a little bit narrow. It is an opportunity nonetheless. So mm -hmm. just wanted to add that in. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I do see a hand raised for Mark, so maybe we can do that as our final question. Hey, thanks a lot. <clears throat> I just wanted to just flag that this, uh, you know, I've been paying very careful attention to what's been going on throughout this call. And also, uh, Katie, thank you for the last piece as well uh, with uh, with that index, which is problematic. Um, you know, and, and I think for the reasons uh, that I'm going to state here is, is all of this is really steeped in whiteness. Um, you know, I think um, Charlie Baker is a, is, is, a, is, a, is a good friend of mine and also we're, you know, starting to, you know, develop a relationship with Frank up here. Uh, does C-Link obviously is, is a, you know, being a, holding a seat on the LAOB. Uh, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, there's there's a lot of conversations going on there, but generally speaking in terms of um, civic engagement uh, for you know various uh, demographics, when you start throwing out terms like GBIC and CCPR, CCRPC, VCDA, SEDS, VHCB, um, uh, and the list goes on. Uh, the truth is, is, is that um, the vast majority, I've been in the state for 14 years, uh, many of these agencies uh, exist in other places. I've lived in 16 other states. Uh, I'm a retired army officer. Um, and I also come from a socioeconomic background where uh, that, you know, where most black folks are poor, um, you know, which Katie is why that index is uh, kind of problematic because most of us are here in Chittenden County. Um, and so you should really think about that. And, and here's where the question is going, and, and it's not even really a question; it's more of a statement. Is is I, I'll drop my I'll drop my um my email address in uh, the chat. You know, I know Jude personally as far as over, over at VLCT. I know some of the work that's happening. Uh, we I, we see some of the things that are happening. It's not enough. It's not happening soon enough. Economic development uh, for Black and Brown folks. Yes, the um the folks over here at the Professors of Color Network are working on another level as well. There's a lot of stuff happening, but I think. Um, there's some serious work that we need to target uh, to make sure uh, that what we're doing is, is we are um, we are realizing the impact of systemic racism on an economic level here across the state. And yes, it is a thing. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to circle around with with Charlie and, and maybe Frank and have some conversations with Gus, which are already started, and maybe some of uh, some others of you. But I, I couldn't let this meeting end without uh, flagging that huge in a big kind of way um, because uh, it, it's, a, it's a problem. Uh, and what it's doing is it's perpetuating a, a wealth gap uh, that already exists, that we already know about. Um, so, but I do appreciate all this information. I've got a, a, a tons of it. And what I'm soliciting is, is if there are those who are on the call and some of you who, some of you maybe not even uh, would be interested in having a conversation, but if you're interested in collaborating uh, with us in ways in which we can figure out, work together to, to, um, to better this process, um, you know, certainly, you know, not just through us, but also through the Richard Kemp Center here in Burlington, um, 
maybe what I can do is, is I can just drop my email. You can send me a note and you can follow up and we can, you can be a part of this ongoing discussion. Thank you uh, for giving me the time at the end of this meeting. Absolutely. And do any of our panelists have anything they want to offer in response? I Sounds mean, like I, I don't know. I just wanted to quickly say too, I, I would, you know, really welcome. Thank you. I'm going to reach out to you, Mark, because one of the our initiatives that we're working on in the fall is as we're trying to build pipelines of people who are ready to serve on community projects and, and um, in town governments in our region, this is really top of mind. So um, I would appreciate we'll we'll all we'll be in touch as I'm planning that program and how we're reaching out to people. We want to make sure that we really are reaching out to everyone and, and making sure that people whose voices haven't traditionally been heard um, are part of that. So um, thanks for saying that. And I have a note. Katie, did you want to say something or no? I was just going to say, um, Mark, I'm going to connect you with Ted Brady, our executive director, and, and we can take the conversation from there. Sound good? Awesome. And, and yeah, completely agree with, with what's been said so far. Reverend Mark would, would love to chat. It sounds like you're already well connected with uh, Gus, who's our executive director at VHCB, but would love to figure out ways that Ready can be supportive of those underserved communities and, and however we can be. Um, so yeah, excited to continue the conversation and collaboration there. Thanks for all that feedback and a special shout out to Mariah and the work that you're doing. And, and I wanna you know just emphasize the fact that yes, I am connected with some of these folks, but it just keep in mind that um, it is rare uh, that an individual like myself, uh, somebody who looks like me and somebody who's doing this kind of work would be uh, connected with some of the folks that I mentioned. It is rare. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for spending time with us. As we said, we have recorded this, so we will have a recording out to all of you on Monday. Um, in addition to the recording, um, we will have the resources from the chat and any other relevant links. Um, thank you all for taking the time. I thank you again to our panelists for uh, sharing their expertise with us. Um, we really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you community leaders who are on the ground doing work in your community uh, day in and day out. It's really part of what makes Vermont so special. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your Friday um, and take care. <laughs>